student choice this week was to look at the application of remote sensing to cyclones. So to do this, what I'd like to do is to look at the disaster management cycle and really break down where remote sensing can be applied at different stages. So you can see there we've got reduction, readiness, response and recovery. And in reduction, we're really considering how we can reduce the likelihood of a, of a hazard. Now, obviously, we can't actually reduce the likelihood of a cyclone occurring, but what we can do is reduce the impact that it has on the community. So this can be through the identification of hazard zones, which can then inform planning. And we can look at mapping floodplains, potential coastal inundation areas and erosion hazards as well. So remote sensing can be used here to start to develop the imagery or the base data around areas that are prone to, to cyclones and the consequent effects of those and see how we can change building codes, um, particularly in areas that are prone to those events. In the readiness period, what we're really looking at doing is how we can increase resilience to the event. It's where the event is actually imminent and we're going to see if we can potentially change people's behaviour around, around their preparedness activities um, and see if that actually assists in the resilience of the community as, as, as a result. So this is really all about preparing data archives. So this is not just remote sensing, but also other spatial information that's available as well. And then communicating the hazard and risk maps to the communities. And so this might be through common media, and you see, you see this done quite frequently, looking at the eye of the storm, where it's approaching, where the, where the, plan, where the likely track of the cyclone is going to be. And this can also be done through looking at sea surface temperature maps, particularly in understanding where the development of a cyclone is going to occur, because we know that cyclones will, will only form in areas where the, the sea surface temperature, the, the sea, sea temperature is above 26.5 degrees. So we, ha we have an area that, that it's, it's only going to occur in certain regions. Now it can move to other areas, but the formation will only be in those set, set regions. And then we, we continue with the ongoing monitoring of the event as it approaches landfall. Now the response phase is, is generally sort of the sexy part of, of disaster management and, and it's often looked at as, as all of disaster management, but that's not actually the case. So disaster management involves the full, the full four phases and they all integrate into each other, not just looking at the response actions there. But this is really all about acquiring imagery immediately after or during the event. And so, so this can be used for search and rescue, assessing the magnitude and the extent of the event itself, um, potentially looking at the, uh, the affected areas, lines of communication and assist evacuation planning as well. And finally, we can look at the rate of recovery or rehabilitation of a community and the landscape. So we look at potentially where there's been temporary housing erected, uh, how debris removal has, has occurred and how quickly that's occurred as well, any vegetation regrowth and reconstruction as well. So this is not just limited to a cyclone event, this is generic for natural hazards or disasters, but it's just in the context of cyclones here. So we can actually cut this into two phases as well and the types of data that are acquired and used for the different phases are based on, on the cause of the event, um, which is all stuff that happens prior to the event and can, and can also look at a lot of modelling. And then the effect is afterwards, so then we're, we're seeing what actually happens in the landscape after the event occurs. So to move forward looking specifically at cyclones, I wanted to show a couple of examples of some recent cyclones and then some others that are a little bit more historic but they've got some really good data sets to show as well. So this one is from Cyclone Ida from just off the coast of Queensland in 2014 and this is a, a modus thermal image. So what you can actually see there is that the warmer temperatures are in the brighter colours and the cold temperatures are in the darker colours. So if you look, we've just got the coastline of Australia up here in Cape York up top and the coast of Queensland and Great Barrier Reef just along here. 
what you can actually see is that this is the main part of the cyclone, this dark area with the really cool temperatures. And you can see the eye of the storm here, so that bright white spot that you can see is actually the sea surface that you can see right through the eye there. So it's got a really defined eye, which means that the, the winds are quite intense there. So this time this is a modus uh, daytime image, so this is an off the aqua platform, which is an afternoon overpass. And the difference that you see here is that the, this is a visible image, so you're, you're actually seeing true color there. So the white is the tops of the clouds as opposed to any temperature effect there. The next one is, is a different cyclone, but the same general area, so up in the Cairns general region, region. this is Cyclone Yasi from a couple of years ago, and this shows us the rainfall that occurred as a result of the cyclone, and this was, this image has, or this map has been created using the TRIM satellite, which actually consists of a number of different sensors. So this has got um, both some microwave sensors on it and some visible infrared sensors as well. And so this, al this allows the sensor to create precipitation maps, which is what you can see on the image just there. So the, the blue regions are the, the higher rainfall. So these are actually quantitative measurements that are, that are created using microwave information. So again, that, that satellite also has a visible infrared scanner on it as well, and it also has a lightning images, imaging sensor as well, which is quite cool. This one only operates between minus, uh, minus and positive 35 degrees of the equator, so it's, it's semi-limited in that respect, um, but in February 2014, there was a new satellite mission that was launched which will extend that coverage from plus or minus 65 degrees. And so that's, that's the GPM or the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. And this provides a coverage every three hours to the 65 degrees south and north of the equator. So that also has on it a range of different sensors that, that operate in the, in the microwave region, which allows it to calculate precipitation intensities and also the 3D structure of precipitating particles. This is a modus true color image of, of Yasi. So obviously you can see quite a lot of cloud there. But the neat thing that you can see here is the amount of resuspended sediment off the coast as well. So the Great Barrier Reef is in along here and there's been quite a lot of sedimentation stirred up there as well. This just zoomed in a little bit uh, on the actual screen. If you get the raw image itself, you can actually see parts of the Great Barrier Reef there that have just had that, that large amount of suspended sediment um, over the top of them there. So this is when you're starting to look at the effects of the cyclone rather than the cyclone itself. So not in Australia, this time just off the coast of Africa. And the reason I'm showing this image, this is a quick scat image. And um, quick scat actually is no longer in operation, but was, was running between 99 and 2009. And it was quite neat because it actually was looking at wind speeds and direction as well. So this image has been created using that particular sensor. And you can see that it's got, all, got the wind vectors and also the colors which are associated with the, with the wind speed of that particular cyclone as well. And this is a series of true color modus imagery that also shows the effects of, of a cyclone event. So this is Cyclone George, George just off the West Australian coast in 2007. And what you're seeing here is, is a pre-cyclone image event. And again, so true color. And if we look at the after event, so just after the cyclone has hit, you can see obviously some cloud associated with that, but the significant flooding that's actually occurred over such a large region there. So remote sensing is really powerful here because it covers such a large area and it shows us areas that are really inaccessible due to that as well. And finally, just a, a slightly different application of looking at remote sensing with respect to cyclone events. And this is looking at the recovery phase of the disaster management cycle and using high spatial resolution imagery this time. So in the upper left here, 
we're looking at at, at a, a small area prior to Hurricane Katrina actually um, causing landfall there. And you can see a number of different features. So we've we've got looks like a running track here, um, some car parks, and some suburban areas here as well. Now, if you look four days after the event, you can see it still considerable areas that have been subject to inundation so you can see the dark bluish colored waters here three weeks later while the water has subsided you can still see quite a bit of sediment around so in the in the car park area you can see it's it's been covered up quite a bit and in around this this upper area here now what's quite interesting then is if you move now to seven months after the event you can see that that we've changed the, the usage type in this area here. So what was a car park now appears to be um, some temporary accommodation that's been erected. And interestingly enough, you can also see all this blue coloring, which is tarpaulins on the top of roofs. So they're going undergoing some reconstruction or fixing in that area. And now if you move on three years later, you can get a bit of a picture as to how fast the area is recovering. So we still have the temporary housing down the bottom here. Um, and even some houses still have the blue top wall and still visible on top of their roofs as well. So if we just have a look at the, um, the interpretation of this, you can actually get a bit of an idea as to how far certain areas have recovered. So in terms of the amount of change over that set period of time. So it's, it's the remote sensing that actually allows us to do that by getting that temporal information and being able to look at those individual time steps. And in this case, with very high spatial resolution imagery as well, it's a really useful application for looking at not only cyclones or hurricanes, but disasters in general.